the wind and the trees with simply not enough to supply their demands. Unlike humans. Humans, on the other hand, have no natural ways to spend their self-generated power, so they keep building it up until the moment they die and expel their generated powers back into the world once more. From ashes to ashes, dust to dust, as they would say. Such a waste. Such a waste. This is where High General Elithareth Lan Elithor comes in, leading the first undefeated legion of eternal light for what will be their tenth and grandest reaping event, an event of the highest honor where warriors and mages of the kingdom would go through the portal created and held open by the royal magi and release any and all humans they could find of their short, pitiful existence and collecting the liberated powers to be put into the grand nexus within the grand city so that it may forever keep the power flowing. There were voices of concerns, rumors that the powers are actually souls of humans, and this is no better than necromancy. But everyone needed the power for their daily lives, so what must be done will be done. Ow. High General Elatharis Lan Elathor wasn't always a high general, though he was the son of one. He started his first reaping as a simple captain of the Shield Mages, whose job was to keep the Legion protected from any and every unexpected problem. It was seen as a rather lowly position, where most of the time was spent shielding the Legion from the rain and dust from wherever the portal sensed them. The humans had never fought back effectively, not against the likes of the great vanguards, anyway. It was always slaughter. Until it wasn't. A few reapings ago, the humans started fighting back. Elatharith could remember it like it was yesterday. It started small. The humans hadn't run away so much that time, and in their rough, vaulty hands were ugly imitations of an elven bow. It started as rocks, then there was a crude arrows and spears that were flung at the advancing legion. It was useless, of course. None of their primitive weapons could pierce the great shield, held by a full battalion of shield mages, and the slaughter continued to power the kingdom. The reaping after that changed everything. When the legion came looking for an easy harvest, the humans turned. They were no longer the harmless, beautiful field of wheat waiting to be reaped. They were warriors. Warriors, who was meant in the loosest sense of the word. Some were clad in crude armor, others had nothing but their wooden clothes, armed with weapons forged from metal, dug from the ground and smelted in rudimentary fire. Their attempts to fight back were still pitiful. Their columns were just a joke, and their infantry died in droves, and their cavalry burned as they charged through bolts of lightning, fire, death, and various other things that meant them harm. But even as their pitiful attempt to fight back was, they changed the reaping forever. No longer do elves go in expecting fields to reap, but now they expect an army to crush. It was easier that way. You don't need to march so far looking for enough humans to kill and collect their power when there's literally an army right in front of you for the picking. Not to mention how much more honorable and exciting one could make it sound. Turns out, stories of battles are quite popular with the ladies. This boosted the number of elves who wished to be amongst the participants in the next reaping considerably, which wasn't a surprise. What was a surprise, however, was when the next reaping came and the first legion marched against the human army once more. They found that humans do indeed have magic. Using an excuse of an imitation of one of their battle staves, the humans yelled their words like as savages they are. Short, simple, and barely any effect. Fire! They shouted, and their staves erupted with power, invisible force smashing against the shield again and again. But it held. 
Fire! They shouted their word of power and a series of what could only be called as large, wheeled metal battle staves erupted with their terrible power, sending imperfect spheres of stone and metal through the air and smashing into the shields. But it was still no match for the shield company, whose power bounced away all harm, allowing the Legion to march up close enough to unleash the real power upon the ranks of the humans, resulting in a bountiful harvest. Although it was the first reaping that the Legion lost some elves, it was only a few, mind, less than a dozen, and their bodies were carried back home like heroes with full military honor, and they grieved for weeks in honor of fallen comrades. It had been some time since that battle. General Elatharis Lion Elathor pulled himself back out from his daydreaming of the upcoming glory of battle. Mounted upon his demigraph, he could see the human army just up ahead, on top of a long length of a hill, far less numerous than what had faced before and hunkered down in the dirty halls. High grounds mattered little, for he was sure the victory is certain. He ordered his army to form up and prepare for battle, and now famous shield company strengthened their shields. Then the hills lit up. Terrible, earth-shaking thunders roared from the hill as the human mages unleashed their deadly sorcery, great thick bolts of power streaking through the air and smashed into the matrixes of wards and shields to the shock of every elf present. The shields that have never failed them, never faltered, then shattered under the awesome power of human sorcery. Thinking quickly, the High General barked out his orders using his magically enhanced voice that thundered over the battlefield. Shield walls were formed as the vanguard began their unstoppable advance towards the human's defensive position. The hill lit up once more. Countless cracks were heard through the air as bolts of raw power were unleashed upon the hapless legion below like a horizontal rain. Then, long arrows of magic that pierced the vanguard shields, which were sung from green glass that have turned away even the mightiest sword blows and have deflected any spells and weapons used by humans before. The ranks of the vanguard soldiers were slaughtered in a similar fashion to how they slaughtered humans. Illaroth Lan Illithal did not feel like a high general when he uttered his incantations of a personal shield spell. The spell, perfected over hundreds of years, was a powerful one, and deflects humans' impossibly fast magical arrows. He tried to rally his troops, but he found that his voice was overshadowed by human's magic. He had to shout at the demigriff knights to follow him towards a glorious charge. It was the only way to restore the morale of his army as they were cut down like grass. His knights formed a formation behind him, preparing for a charge. However, the charge never got off, as the very earth around them erupted, throwing elves high into the air more often than not, in pieces. High General Elatharis Lan Elithal knew at that moment that the battlefield was no longer theirs, his army lying broken and bleeding on the ground. Those who died were the fortunate ones. Everything was wrong. He was supposed to win. The High General couldn't do anything. No orders came to mind, not ones that would help the situation. He was waiting for himself to wake up from this nightmare back at the capital, a day before the reaping. Yes, he must have had one nectar too many. This couldn't possibly happen. It couldn't be real. Relief flooded through his body, and Elatharis began to laugh. His demographs head cocked slightly at him, waiting for its master's command. Then, without warning... Its skull burst into a fine mist of several shades of red and pink. Elatharis' shields shattered from an unbelievably strong invisible force that tore through all of his defensive matrixes. And the magical force continued until it ripped his left arm right 
out of its socket, throwing him off of his now headless demigriff. Pain jolted him awake, and he meekly mumbled words of healing to stop the bleeding before exhaustion took a hold of him once more. Perhaps this time, he'll wake up from this horrible nightmare. Illithareth woke back up, but his back was aching. He was not laying on his comfortable bed back in the Grand City, but still in the same patch of dirt and grass where everything went wrong. He couldn't feel his left arm, and he wasn't sure if his legs still worked. Everything hurt, and he could barely utter any words at all. His eyes worked frantically, looking for any sign of salvation, only to spot a figure walking towards him. And it wasn't an elf. The High General struggled to prop himself up with one arm, wheezing and gasping for air as the human mage approached him and drew his battle wand, an ugly, unrefined, strange-looking wand made from some wood Elithoreth couldn't recognize. Elithoreth's eyes crossed as he looked at the wand led up to the human, and Elithoreth land Elithor, High General of the First Undefeated Legion of the Eternal Light, felt fear. Wait, stop, I have gold, I have woman, I'll give you anything, just please don't kill me, please. Elithoreth tried, pleading for his life through choked breaths as he tried to push himself away. The human mage didn't even hesitate as he uttered his own words of power. The United States of America does not negotiate with terrorists. The last thing, Elithoreth Lan Elithor, High General of the First Undefeated Legion of the Eternal Light, saw was the human's battle one discharging its full power right between his eyes. With that light, whatever worries or fear he had was finally left behind him, smeared all over the ground. End of story. Story number one. War Games, written by Shogun CDN. Admiral Vernus stared at the screen mutely. The fleet was at a standstill over the fourth planet in the system. By his orders, this was to have been a simple mission. They had done this countless times in their history, and this should have been no different. And yet it was. Protocol dictated that the invasion should have begun long ago. Probes had detected a resource-rich planet and no hyperdrive signatures anywhere near the solar system. The Admiral had gained his position through a number of usual factors, intelligence and hard work amongst them. But he had prided himself on his curiosity, something many of his people lacked. They had been dominant in the galaxy for so long, most of his people had simply come to accept that the galaxy was simply there to provide for them. For generations, fleets like the one he commanded had scoured the stars, subjugating races they encountered and taking the riches of their planets for their own people. Any resistance was dealt with quickly, and they were unmatched in their military might. There were a few dozen species that had developed hyperdrive technology. His people had defeated a few and made alliances with the rest. The terms of the alliance were always one-sided and amounted to no more than voluntary servitude, but had accomplished the same thing and saved some time and resources that a protracted engagement may have required. He should have reported on the progress of the battle long ago, and yet he had not because his curiosity made him review some of the transmissions from the third planet. What he saw almost made his blood freeze. The door to his chamber chimed, and he motioned it open. Captain Tuan bowed gracefully before entering. The captain was a veteran of several campaigns and a competent and unimaginative commander who did well enough when following orders and protocols. The Admiral had little hope for the captain to do much more than he was told but the fleet had never been challenged enough to test most of its commanders. Admiral, I apologize for the interruption, but we have held the position for several cycles now, and the strict communication silence you ordered, but... The captain faltered at the last, even suggesting that you were questioning superior officer could land you lifelong garbage duty, regardless of your position. Admiral Vonus waved a long, slender arm, directing the captain's attention to the screen. 
The captain watched in silent images. His eyes widened, and a slight cap formed in his mouth. Is this... Yes, the admiral replied. This is the current transmission from the planet. Captain, what is the protocol for a mission such as ours? The captain snapped to attention, his training kicking in. Albert of bombardment to soften defenses followed by ground invasion. Once control of the planet is established, uh, the indigenous species isn't intelligent enough. They'll be put to work collecting resources. If not, they are turned into reserves. Correct. And despite the split, it is a ground invasion that is key. For all that we may do from space, unless we control the ground, our mission cannot succeed. True? The Admiral asked. No, of course, sir, replied the captain. So, how do you think that our ground forces would fare against that? The Admiral said, gesturing again to the screen. The captain again watched an unimaginable violence played out before him. The species of this planet seemed to have an incredible appetite for battle, and the forces that they threw against one another was something that he had never witnessed. The species attacked each other with power at speed and he could not comprehend. They were bulky and thickly muzzled and did not seem to tire. He looked at his own thin arms and delicate chestplate and wondered how long he might last if he encountered one of these creatures in battle. Just as we temper our metals in fire and pressure, this hostile planet has created something we have never seen. Perhaps long ago our people may have been their equals, but we've grown weak over the eons, too dependent on our technology to be made soft in comparison. We have not walked through the fire in a very long time, Captain. This species revels in it. Our soldiers would not last one cycle against behemoths such as this, the Admiral said. But we detected no hyperdrive. Could we not simply maintain orbital bombardment until they capitulate? The captain asked. From what I have seen, by the time that happened, the planet would be unusable for us, all them. Well, our subjects are currently docile. If they were to find out that we committed genocide, we would find ourselves with revolts on many fronts. No, Captain, there is only one cause of action we can take. Leave the system and pray that it is a very long time before these uh, humans discover hyperdrive technology. We can only hope that when we meet them, they'll accept our terms of alliance. If not, the Admiral trailed off, leaving the thought unfinished. Set calls for home, Captain. We need to report on this and quarantine the sector. The Admiral commanded. The captain exited quickly, and the admiral turned his attention back to the screen. He let out an involuntary shudder before turning off the screen, as the last image breaked the score that read, Giant 17, Cowboys 21. End of story. Story number two. Inquiries written by Satoshi. Rice had just finished tidying up his composure when one of the captives he was guarding began to snigger. Again, turning about, he stalked up to the two Imperials locked away in their cell. Shut up! Oh, lighten up, rebel boy, the one called Aza chided. Her cellmate Doran was the one who'd been making the noise. Both of them were Darvarin, with their characteristic strong builds and ashen skin. The guard resisted the urge to whip out his pistol. You are prisoners! You are Imperial wretches! Start acting like it! Isa leaned back with the grice, assumed was a mocking offense. Why, my dear friend here was just having a laugh, weren't you, Doran? Prisoners aren't supposed to be having laughs, Griff spat back. Doran answered, yeah, yeah, rebel boy. I was just thinking the last time someone dragged Jennifer into an interrogation room. Jennifer, their third companion, Grice remembered, and a human woman currently being interrogated. <laughs> Trying to tithe me, huh? Price, injured. Typical Imperial mind games. The guard strolled away from the cell door. Suit yourself, Doran said with a shrug. A minute of lackluster silence tickled on. Finally, Grice settled back towards the cell. What happened last time? With Jennifer in the interrogation room, I mean. Doran locked his gaze on Grice before his mouth split into a grin and he started laughing again. Liza just shook her head and gave Grice a coy smile. Why don't you just see for yourself, rebel boy? See for myself. He glanced at the interrogation room door. Yeah, 
Go and look, Isa prodded. She's probably already making quick work of your pal in there. Ah, you almost got me, Grice laughed, a little more nervously than he attended. Damned Imperials! He walked away from the cell door, deciding not to let the prisoners muddy his thoughts. But as he stood there, the gears in his mind began to whir into motion. Maybe the human woman had a concealed weapon. Maybe she had some sort of inherent ability previously unknown. What if she was overpowering Grice's colleague, Roll, at this very moment? No, that was impossible. The guard was just starting to shake such a dark thoughts from his head when he heard the weeping come from the interrogation room. But he knew the voice. It wasn't the woman's. Ripping his pistol from its holster, Grice dashed to the door and slammed it open. He spotted Rell, who had tears trickling from his eyes, and Rell was sitting in the interrogation table where Jennifer stroked the man's shoulder with a gentle hand. And that's the last thing I said to him, Rell lamented, between breaths, his voice damp with remorse. We haven't seen each other in years, and we used to be so close. A few tears slid down his face again, hardly fitting for someone in his position. People just drift apart sometimes, Jennifer said in a tone that Christ found oddly soothing. Neither she nor Raoul seemed to find Christ's entrance noteworthy. But they don't have to, you know. You can try finding him again. Raoul shook his head. I doubt that he would want to speak to me. That's what I thought about my sister, Jennifer replied. Turns out she was thinking the exact same thing about me. Now we're almost as close as we were when we were children. Really? You, uh, you really think that that uh, could be the case for me too? Raoul snuffed him. Well, more likely than not. Jennifer smiled, then looked up as if just noticing the armed guard that had burst into the doorway. Oh, hello, Mr. Grice, please. Don't think any less of your friend here. Even the strongest soldiers need to shed some tears. Snap away from the prisoner, Grice warned. What did you do? We were just talking, Jennifer professed, with her hands raised, her face growing stoic. Raoul nodded with a seeming appreciation. Talking, huh? Talking! Seems like all you Imperials do is talk. He leveled his pistol sight straight at her heart. Get back to the cell, now! Just a little while longer, Mr. Grice. Get back to the cell, or I will gun you down right now. Jennifer donned a solemn expression. You just shoot me, like this. I wonder what your wife would think. My, my, my wife, Grice stuttered. How in the hell did she know that? Does she think highly of what you do? Quiet! Your wife doesn't approve of any of this. Isn't that right? Shut up! Isn't that right? Grife scoffed. She, uh, she thinks that the Imperium is in the right, and that I'm an idiot for joining this rebellion. I should be talking with this woman, he thought. But you want to fight for the rebel cause because you believe in it more than you believe in her. The man stared, her words biting into his mind. His pistol arm inched downwards. Suddenly, maybe. No! She just doesn't get it. Jennifer leaned forward. Oh, what doesn't she get? I'm doing this for her, Grice answered, unable to contain himself. He tried to drudge up the rebel calls from his mind, but all that surfaced was the paycheck and the image of his wife, alone in their tiny home. How long has it been since you've seen her? Jennifer asked. Too long. The human woman gestured to the open chair next to Rel. Want to talk about it? Surprisingly. Grice found himself sitting down. Three days later, Jennifer and her team arrived at the nearest Imperial base, with several new defectors. Then, story number one, Minigun, written by Hope Data Adam. Ready up! I heard my commander shout, and I and my comrade stood up in the trench, our weapons in hand and our sights are high. We, the Gurna Confederacy, have been called to war by the Galactic Federation against the Greater Terran Union. The GTU and the humans presumably violated galactic law which led to this war that we are fighting in. Humans, several sun cycles ago after joining the Galactic Federation, already sparked trouble that enraged the entire Galactic Federation Council so much that we were being sent to war with them for it. Not like I care about the reason the war started. Being a conscript means I'm not willing enough to look into the background of things like this. Now that our artillery bombardment has passed, we will charge the human lines with all of our might. Stand proud, Garners! This is a day where you claim glory and honor for your family. 
We the Gurners were chosen as the G of Saw because we are the most anatomically closest to the humans. We're bipedal with digigrade legs. The humans classify them as. We have two arms and we also breathe oxygen and are carbon-based life forms. This will make the invasion of human worlds much easier for the Galactic Federation. The humans are staggered, weak, even they themselves are fractured. A custom, we were given a brief look at the opponent. The humans run a decentralized government system, where multiple governments and nations exist being guided by a central government. Their weapons are unreliable, insignificant. Just yesterday, I received a message from our linebreakers that managed to decrypt the humans' transmissions. It said something unbelievable and baffling that everyone had read and laughed. Shipments of many guns on their dropships to front lines. The humans use kinetic weapons as their primary offense and defense weapons. Using the informal word guns is quite common to classify them. A weapon so small that they call it a mini is so insignificant. How will they ever do damage to the enemy? I wondered. We will bring glory to the Confederation, and we will bring pride to the Federation. Ready yourselves, the battle is upon us. We stepped forward and pushed ourselves against the wall, awaiting the signal to go over the trench and charge. And that signal came, a wailing alarm that spread across the entire trench of my battalion. We screamed at the top of our lungs while we pushed ourselves up over the trench and set our legs onto the dirt. Some of us began firing while most continued to charge the enemy, including me. I see the enemy's position, a line of prefabricated bunks similar to ours as well as trenches. It felt like a full minute of running and sprinting and I began to feel ill in my stomach, like impending doom was about to strike me and my battalion. Then I heard a faint whirring. Instinctively, I dropped down onto the ground on my stomach, and a rain of bullets and a deafening sound of brrrt bombarded us. To my sights, my friends and comrades fall, and the chaotic melancholy of defending fire is mixed with the screams and yells of my fellow soldiers. There on the dirt and mud of the battlefield, I truly felt fear. I never faced combat and only just recently been conscripted, but I'm sure what I felt there was true fear. The fear of death and the fear of dishonor. I cowered like a coward, quickly trembling and my hands shaking as I hold my weapon close to me. Just as quick and as unexpected as it began, it ended abruptly. And the battlefield fell silent for a moment before cries of my comrades echoed across the blasted hellscape. I heard some call out to their mothers, some apologize to their fathers and siblings. Few muttered a vow. Kalasya, Barajanaya. I breathed heavily, scared to move an inch, the sound of boots slowly becoming closer. My heart raced a mile a second, and my vision blurred. I asked myself what to do, but it didn't matter, as the enemy was already right in front of me. The humans yelled at me to let go of my weapon, but the guns trained on me. I did so without hesitation, and quickly afterwards they pulled me to my feet. I was ashamed of myself, displaying cowardice to the enemy and surrendering without even a fight. Not only to shame myself, but to my family's name as well. They moved my hands behind my head and began to escort me back to the defensive line. I didn't look back at my trench, nor did I remember any other member of my battalion being captured. All I heard from behind me was yelling and gunfire, probably the humans clearing out our trench. As I jumped down into the human trenches, I finally see what caused such a hellfire. Two compact multi-barreled weapons. They are huge, mounted on the edge of the trench. One of the humans that saw my bewildered face chuckle and pointed at it. They talked to me. Beautiful, aren't they? Miniguns do wonders to meet shields like you. So, they are those miniguns. Before I could even respond, a moment later I was pushed from behind to keep walking. Chaos in a compact package, the very definition of a bullet hose, the antithesis of precision, a hammer to crack a nut, the minigun, six barrels, endless fire, a terrifying weapon of mass annihilation. End of story. Story number two. How does it taste? Written by Sinchi Dev. Excuse me, uh, what? I wonder...
How does it taste? Humans are weird. I mean, achieving the title of Apex Predator in a planet with millions of species requires a special kind of being. But humans are really weird, even for predator races like myself. Shouldn't we worry about it after we kill it? Okay. The human points his rifle, one of those ancient projectile-based rifles, and shoots. The gigantic Manathon groans in pain, then crumbles. Okay, now it's dead. I wonder, how does it taste? Now I'll, I'll go and find out then. Um, the, the company said that we can manage this disposal however we see fit, right? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. We're a part of an extermination company that deals with numerous species around the galaxy. If you have an invasive species, a monster outside its territory, or some experiment gone wrong, you'd call us. We've been in the business for many galactic cycles. Ever since non-predator species had troubles with irresponsible xenos and the dangerous pets. He comes back with a few slices of meat from the manathon and unpacks his portable grill, a kind of cooking device humans use. Want to find out about the taste too? Sure, why not? He starts cooking the meat. It smells good, but I have to know. Peter, can I ask you something? Of course, Sam. Um, what do you want to know? Why was your first question, how does it taste, instead of, can I kill it? Sorry, uh, but I don't understand the question. I mean, weren't you worried that you couldn't kill it? Peter looks confused. What do you mean? Uh, did it look like an immortal creature from the mythology of your planet? No, no, I mean, uh, how did you know that you were able to kill it? I mean, uh, it was alive. If, if it's alive, it can be killed. That's how the killing concept works, right? Peter said with a chuckle. But what if you couldn't? You mean like a zombie? Or if it was invulnerable? What's a zombie? It's a being that is dead, but it still moves, and since it's dead, it can't be killed unless you completely destroy it. No, no, what a horrible concept. Let me rephrase. How did you know that your skills were enough to kill it? I don't, um... Uh, why wouldn't them? I start to understand. Peter, have your species ever encountered a being that was too dangerous or too strong and couldn't be killed? Well, um, no, I think not. Uh, not really. There was Moby Dick and some mythical creatures, but, but none that, that couldn't be killed. So the only limitation your species could be able to kill a being is that it should be alive first. Well, yes, um, isn't that the same for everyone? Are, are you okay? In my planet, there's a being called the Zopron. It remained the one being that we were not able to kill before achieving FTL travel. Even now, some people still fear it. The Manathon you just killed is the same for the people of this planet. Oh, you mean like Moby Dick? I don't. It was a giant animal that killed a group of men that tried to hunt it down. I understand you now, Glob. No, we don't have a Moby Dick. Earth, maybe it's not as dangerous as I thought. Peter looks offended. That's uh, what you think? Well, you don't have an unkillable monsters, do you? You haven't faced a monster that kills for fun and eats anything in its path. Peter looks angry. He starts looking for something on his tablet. Maybe I went a bit too far. Humans are a proud species after all. Here, Peter says. Look at this. He gives me the tablet. What? What monstrous creatures are these? A creature full of fur and giant tusks and a giant feline with teeth as long as your arm. Wait, these are not pictures. These are paintings. You're trying to trick me, human. These are not pictures. These are paintings. Surely from your... Ma no. The woolly mammoth and the saber-tooth. What an appropriate name. Uh, work right, real. Uh, the reason we don't have any pictures of them is that we killed them before even being a civilization. How could this be? He doesn't seem to be lying. He takes the tablet from my hand, searches again, and hands it to me again. There they are. It's skeletons. They were real. I can't process this. The manathon beat is ready. Peter looks pleased with my dumbfounded expression. Well, Glob, it seems I can miss you. Here. He hands me some perfectly grilled manathon meat. Let's eat. When I was a kid in my hometown, there was someone that thought that he could hunt a Zapron. He was obviously mistaken, and one day later, the police had to go and look for his remains. To this day, I remember what my father told me that day. I wonder, my boy, what drives those monsters? Peter was mistaken. There was an unkillable monster on Earth, and I found the answer to my father's question. 
Wake up, Glob. Tell me, how does it taste? End of story. What price a word? Written by Radius 55. Get up the stairs! Ambassador Rutilia paused, staring behind at the mass. Almost 20,000 beings of a dozen races could be seen. Some were rebels, armed with a motley assortment of weaponry that was nonetheless perfectly capable of ending her life. Mixed in were professional agitators, experts at inflaming the passions of the disaffected and molding it to whatever way that their paymasters desired. But the majority were common folks, lashing out at their governments for getting into a war that they could not win. A perfectly understandable, if disappointing, reaction. Unfortunately, as a representative of the winning side, Rutilia was a legitimate and much more accessible target for their wrath. Come on, man! The human, John Mattingly, shouted again, grabbing her by the slender, fur-covered arm and dragging her bodily up the flight. The human was a leader of a dozen security contractors the Othwain's collective had hired to beef up security of a guard. As distasteful as Ambassador found using mercenaries, they had come highly recommended and it was cheaper to outsource the brawl than to keep them on staff. Her personal team consisted of eight fellow Othwain bodyguards, and, at least up until this morning, she considered them more than enough. Well, she had eight bodyguards. Seeing the seething tide of destruction heading their way, the commander had deserted and the rest had followed suit. Their abandonment had left one ambassador, Ruotilia, alone but for her twelve hired human guards. It had surprised her to no end that these mercenaries didn't join the exodus. Rather, they had found this building, a solid reinforced ceramic construct, to hold up in and were now busy fortifying it. It was almost like they expected to be able to hold on long enough for reinforcements to arrive. In here, Ambassador, the human said, leading her into a section of empty offices midway up the structure. At one time, they would have bustled with life. But the war had drained the local economy of labor and capital. Now it was an empty shell with bare, stone-cold walls. Now, I need you to... She got the man off, Mr. Mattingly. Agent, ma'am, he corrected. I'm sorry, Agent Mattingly. Rutilia corrected with only a trace of the inner turmoil she felt reaching her voice. She hadn't even bothered to say more than ten words to these beings in the hours before this mess. Now... She wished that she'd gotten the chance to know these brave souls. I thank you for your aid, but it's pointless. If you would leave a rifle and some ammunition, you may feel free to make your escape. It's me, the mob wants. Mattingly took his time in responding. Thank you, Ambassador Rutidia, he began, actually managing to pronounce the odd syllables as if he were a native. But I think we'll just as soon stay right here. Rutidia was aghast, but there are more than a thousand of them for each of you. Do you honestly expect to survive those odds? Humans have made it through worse, he replied, shrugging. And even if we don't, there are much worse ways to die. But my team and I are committed. There's no backing out now. She continued to stare at him, gaping, as the human met her gaze nevily. It was inconceivable that these mercenaries would be more willing to lay down their lives in her defense than the members of her own nation. Or that a species so obviously insane could ever have achieved spaceflight. Now, ma'am, if we're gonna defend this place, we need to get you secure and our defenses in place. The ambassador once again allowed herself to be led away. As she was moved further back into the building, she passed other humans moving purposefully. She saw them setting out mines and charges. Some were erecting hasty barricades and fighting positions, while others strung nano wire across hallways. One burly-skinned man seemed to be setting up what had to be a crew-served plasma caster. Where did you get all of this? She asked hesitantly. We, uh, convinced a few of your guards to part with some hardware before they, um, made their exit. Agent Mattingly said as tactfully as he could, but uh, most of it we carried ourselves. You carried that? She asked, pointing incredulously at the crew-served weapon that they had just passed. There was no way her personal guards would have been able to carry a 57-kilo monster like that around without her noticing. <laughs> yeah, Schlock has a thing for big guns. Um, he grabbed it out of the truck as we bailed, and I'm really glad he did. 
But you were hired as a light protection detail. The slender Colleen flicked her ears in exasperation. Yes, ma'am, uh, and right now I wish we had come with a heavy loadout. If we had our armor, I probably wouldn't even have bothered holding up here. We could have cut a path to safety. No sweat. Then he led her through the door into one of the central rooms of the building. Inside were several electronic devices along with a massive fiber optic cabling and a few piles of supplies. How had they managed to set this up in a few short minutes that they'd been in the building escaped her? Elka, keep an eye on the Ambassador while I look over these readings. Pleased to meet you, Ambassador, the human female said. She had what Rutilia sounded like a strangely stilted accent, cooked with an emphasis on odd syllables. You can sit here, ma'am. The tall, golden-haired woman motioned to a pile of packs as she rummaged for something. And please, put this on. It's not as good as tailored armor, but it will still stop most impacts. Thank you, um, Elka, was it? The ambassador asked, shrugging into the heavy plate carrier. It was designed for humans, but the two species were close enough in build that it wasn't a bad fit. Yes, Ambassador Rutilia, it's a team name. Well, since we'll be dying together, please call me Yawol, the alien female said dryly. Alka cocked her head and responded, Would not count us amongst the dead just yet. She was about to respond when a buzz brought her attention to one of the multitude of screens. Through it, she saw that the mob had brought by pry bars and cutting torches and attacking the building doors with abandon. Build to withstand vandalism and petty burglary. They were strong, but couldn't stand up to concentrated attack. Elka, I think it's about time we welcome our guests, John said, pointing. The woman seemed to inflate slightly as she asked, How's the crowd? I would not want to start the poll, Ernie. They're packed shoulder to tentacle down there, was the reply. At least a dozen have been trampled by the rest. Good. But make sure you get the video. <laughs> yeah, I got of three angles, Mattingly responded in an amused tone. Then his voice chilled as he gave the command. Do it. Halka's finger stabbed down on the control, and there was a muted thump. Rutilia watched through the screen as the door was blown off its hinges by several precisely placed charges. For a moment... She was surprised that her bodyguards would have wasted even the relatively few minutes of protection the door would have afforded them in exchange for injuring a handful of attackers. Then the thermobaric charge strapped to the back detonated in the middle of the crowd. Several hundred attackers were instantly pulped by the deflagration burn, organs turned to mush by the sudden wall of air that thundered through them. Almost a thousand more were injured to varying degrees, ranging from massive bruising to ruptured oral cavities to damaged respiratory systems. For a moment, it looked like the mob had been broken by the carnage. And then they seemed to explode, racing for the suddenly unbarred doorway. The horde crashed into the lobby and into the building, searching for their prize. But they were hunting a very dangerous game, as a steadily accumulated body count aptly indicated. Mines ranging from 12 poppers to in place charges to modern equivalent of old fashioned M18 Claymore Old Firth fame cut huge swaths through the advancing parties. Unsuspecting frontrunners were cut in half as by an invisible razor, as the pressure of those behind them forced them into the monomolecular carbon nanofilament. Others were crushed as pre stress supports gave way under the weight of hundreds of bodies. But the flood would not be stopped by mere traps. They were hungry for blood, and they had their victim cornered. This depleted but still substantial force burst through the stairwell and straight into the messed human fire. Hypervelocity rifles barked and flechette guns coughed as dozens of bodies hit the floor. Then the crew's serve plasma caster opened up and the remainder of the attackers flash fried. A few still in the stairway caught the edge of the blast and fell writhing as they received instant third-degree burns. Once again, the crowd surged, some charging into the kill zone as the horrible weapon charged for another shot. A few of the smarter searched for an alternate route or a thin wall that they could break down. Eventually, they would find a way in. If you excuse me, Madam Ambassador, I need to get to the defenses, Agent Mattingly said as he turned to leave for the relative safety of the interior office. Mate, Britannia interrupted, before you go, answer one question. At a nod, she asked simply, Why? Excuse me? Maddeningly asked, confused. Why are you here? Why do you stay rather than escape when you had a chance? I mean, for universe's sake, we're not even the same species. 
Agent John Mattingly looked at her for a long moment before saying simply, We gave you our word. Without that, what are we? And then he turned and sprinted to where the rest of his men and women were preparing to fight and die, simply to preserve their honor. Captain Hurrah of the Athwa Ains Marine Corps shook his head as he walked over the carpet of bodies that littered the square. He'd seen some terrible things in the people's service, but he didn't think that even the massacre of Dalto Prime was quite on this level. No, he thought, as he passed a body whose lungs had been torn out through the mouth by the implosion effect of a thermobaric bomb. This is definitely worse than that. He had wanted to lead his company off the light cruiser, the Protector Fruma, hours ago. Politics prevented that. The station commander, an incompetent if he had ever seen one, had spent the time trying to convince the locals to do the job. Good PR, he said. Show our trust, he said. It made Hurrah want to vomit. The locals wouldn't have bothered to piss on a Lithuanian if they had been on fire, and the delay had probably cost the ambassador her life. What a waste, he muttered to himself as he climbed through the shattered remains of the doorway. But at least they died well. And so they had. By the captain's practice time, there were over 6,000 dead between the square and the first floor alone. He grew more impressed as he continued through the building. It was obvious. Whoever had planned this dispense knew their stuff, and Hurrah was going to make sure that he got a medal for it. Even if it was posthumous. Sir, a voice called out over the comms, I think you're the one to see this. Twelfth floor, through the stairwell three. Captain acknowledged the call and began to make his way to the indicated position. As he did, the bodies seemed to get thicker. Some appeared to have been left where they fell, but a vast majority looked to have been moved to an out-of-the-way spot, as if to make room for more to take their place. Walking onto the twelfth floor lander, he was suddenly faced with a mountain. It reached the ceiling and covered a patch of flooring eight meters across and at least five deep. He couldn't tell if it went any further than that because it was obviously centered on a doorway. At the mountain, it was made of corpses. I think we found the last stad, he told the gathered marines around him. Time to start digging. He proceeded to grab a body and hurl it to the side. A few of the soldiers looked more than a little reluctant, but they joined their officer in the job. Soon, the doorway was clear enough to squeeze a suit through. So Captain Hurrah laid down and Betty crawled over the top of the pile. On the other side, he froze. The pile did indeed extend for several meters into the room, but that wasn't what grabbed his attention. It was the six humans sprawled against the far wall. They were covered in bandages, quick heel, and a couple of splints. Blood soaked their clothing, and it was obviously at least partly their own. They were slumped there like so many dead but they weren't. Captain Hurrah saw one lift his head and nod slowly to the Othwain's officer. Then, as the Marine regained his senses and began to move forward once again, he pulled a small package from his pocket. Ambassador Rutilia, he asked, hesitantly, almost afraid of the answer. The human jerked a thumb to the doorway. Back there, he said in a voice that spoke of unimaginable exhaustion. I've got a medic looking at her. Not much else he can do here he said, indicating their dressed wounds and the five blank-covered forms laid neatly in the corner. She's fine, he continued, cutting off the captain's next question. Just the shock of the ordeal. Hurrah nodded and ordered a pair of his troops to secure the ambassador as he removed his helmet to get a good look at the man in front of him. The human had reduced a cigarette from the package and lit it with a small device. He wrinkled his nose in disgust at the thing. Tobacco was outlawed in most planets as a carcinogen and a filthy habit. But the human took a long drag, anyway. That stuff will kill you, you know, Hurrah said. He was stupid, but he had to say something. And the noxious smoke was messing with his mind. The human looked down at the cancer stick, and then at his comrades, living and dead, before moving to the much larger pile of would-be murderers against the far wall. Finally, his gaze returned to the alien in front of him, and it seemed to her uh, as if the man was staring right through him. Yeah, John Mattingly said, sighing. But uh, at this point, uh, they'll have to get in line. End of story. The Call, written by Cold Fire Knight. 
Control to all units. We have a white male, approximately 50 years of age, not breathing, not responsive, at 400 4th Street. Fire and EMS are en route. My pulse starts racing. I know that house, that little brick one on the corner. I'm close, maybe even close enough to count this time. It's late and there's no traffic. Yeah, maybe this time. I pick up my mic, voice steady. 349, control, en route, ETA, two minutes. Two minutes isn't very long, unless someone is dying. I flip the switch, bringing flashing lights and blaring sirens to life. Slamming the gas pedal on the floor won't make my car accelerate any faster, but I do it anyways. I hear the other units responding, further away than I am, and know that I'll be there first. Know what that means. Doesn't matter as streets blur by while I shift my eyes to keep tunnel vision setting in. 349, control, ETA for fire and EMS. Silence. This is the silence I hate, knowing the answer is almost always not soon enough. 349, fire says 5 minutes, EMS says 10. Roger, I respond, knowing it's all on me until the others show up. There it is, 4th Street. I shift my foot from the gas to the brake, back to the gas, barely slowing enough to make the turn. Thank God there's no traffic, and I'm only four blocks away. Four blocks. Maybe this time. There! People outside the house, standing by the road, waiting on help to come. I need to park clear of the entry so the others can get inside quickly when they arrive. They'll need room, and this is such a small house. I kill the sirens and grab the mic again. 349, control, show me on scene. They acknowledge me as I break and slide to a stop clear of the front entrance. I jump out, getting the siren, but leaving my lights flashing for the others to see. While sparing a precious second to lock the door, securing my car and weapons inside before placing them out of my mind for now. There are people around me now, all yammering as I run for the door, hoping that I'm in time. I pass through the door. God, this living room is so small, and see him lying on his side on the floor, body giving small twitches. Someone says Control told him to put him like that. I'm grateful. At least someone was listening this time. My mind tries to flash back to the last call like this. I'm trying to find the apartment, and Control tells me the caller is crying, but refusing to do CPR on the infant. I lock that away, hard. There's no time for that, only for the man in front of me. I take a few steps needed to cross the room and drop to a knee beside him, ask his name, how long he's been down, when anyone last saw him. One of them was in the room with Steve, and now I know who I'm trying to save, when it happened. And they called immediately, so maybe five minutes. The others flutter around us, asking me if Steve will be alright, if he'll make it. They're full of hope, worry, and fear for him. I can barely hear the next siren, but give them a confident expression that they want, they need, as I place my hands on Steve's chest. I look from them to Steve. Steve, can you hear me? Pause, no response. Steve, I'm going to start CPR on you. Help is on the way. Still no response. So I notify control that I'm starting compressions and to cancel the timer. God, that sounds ominous, but I don't need the distraction. They watch me struggling against death, trying to save Steve from him. My focus splits once I press down. Come on, damn it. Not another one, please. I was here as fast as I could. Please let it be enough. They tell me that Steve had open heart surgery a couple weeks ago. Do I feel his ribs giving beneath my hands? Can I keep pushing this hard on him? My back's to the door and I hear someone else come into the room. The rookie, Turner, comes into view and stops. I spare a glance at him and see it. This is his first one. His first time seeing someone try to save a man. And he's frozen in place. I remember that time and give him what he needs. 
Turner, go with them and get his medications. For the ambulance, they'll be here soon. He's still not breathing. God, he's still not breathing. His mouth keeps opening, but he's not breathing. Please, please make it. I hear more sirens, closer. Turner snaps out of it and asks the woman to take him to the medications. Good. He got them away from watching this. Turner may not be okay later, but he's okay right now, and that's what matters. Another person comes in the door behind me, asks what I need. I recognize Paulson's voice. Tell control, subject is still non-responsive. Compressions, ongoing. Get new ETAs, then wait outside and direct them in here once they arrive. Try and keep the people outside calm. I hear him leave and listen to the radio traffic that follows, alone with Steve. I talk to him as I press down, watching him twitch with the motions, but still no response. Different sirens are drawing closer now, but I don't know who it is. My arms are sore, no idea how long I've been going, but it's just me between him and death. I can't let him go, no matter that my own pulse is still racing. Specks flashing across my vision, because I just can't lose another one. Please. I hear the door open again, and voices I don't recognize are wanting to help. I tell them to clear a path for the EMTs, knowing it's only thing that they can do. It gives them a purpose, lets them believe that everything will be okay because they helped. Come on! The door opens again, and I recognize the voices as firemen. They know exactly what's at stake right now. Renewed energy flows through me, and I keep pumping on Steve's chest. I'm telling them what I know about him, his history, and how long I've been working on him. I tell them that I've got him until they can hook him up to the AED. Maybe this time. Maybe. Please. One of them tells me it's okay to stop. They're ready. I pull back and straighten up, my head spinning from the change. I watch them put the patches on him and hook up the wires. The AED tells us to stop compressions as it reads Steve. Come on! AED starts giving directions. Stay clear. I watch Steve flop as he tries to shock his heart back into rhythm. It says to start compressions and I lean back in to take over. One of the firemen stops me, thanks me and tells me that they've got him. I nod back to him before standing up to take stock of the situation. The EMT should be able to get into the living room once they arrive, but there's no room for anyone else. I call Turner, tell him to keep the woman in the back rooms until the ambulance gets clear, unless there's another door that they can exit through. After he acknowledges me, I walk outside and can hear another siren drawing close. Despite all of the flashing lights surrounding the house, I notice that there's no actual noise and nobody needs me right now. I close my eyes and dip my head as my hands finally start shaking. Please, please let him live. Please let him be okay. They need him and I could really use this one. Please. I open my eyes as the ambulance finally arrives. Paulson walks up beside me, asks if Steve is going to make it. My hand stops shaking as I give him the same confident expression the woman inside got. Say, I think it'll work out. I tell him to get the door while I bring the EMTs up to speed on what's happening. He nods and heads back towards the house. I move towards the ambulance and start talking. Please... I watch the EMTs race into the house with their gear on the stretcher between them. Once they're inside, Paulson lets go of the door and starts walking towards me. I can see Tucker coming over from where he'd come out of the back door with the woman. I can see that they're both worried, unsure what's going to happen. Please let him pull through. I tell them our part is done and we did what we could. I tell them that they did good work because they did. And what else can I say? I release them from the call, assuring them that I'll handle anything else that comes up. There it is, the mixture of worry and relief on their faces. 
knowing that they're free to go, but afraid that they could have done more. I watch them leave before closing my eyes and taking a slow, deep breath, hands trembling again. Oh God, please! I release the breath and the prayer, walk back to the house. Nothing I can do but watch from just inside the door, out of the way. Some of the people come up behind me and ask how Steve is. When he make it, I assure them he's getting the best care possible until he's stable for transport. They nod, accepting my words, and walk away. I see it when it happens. Steve jerks, then gasps and coughs. The machine tells them to stop compressions. Everyone starts talking to Steve then. Does he know who he is? Where he is? Does he know what happened? They move him to the stretcher, and I hold the door for them. I help them load Steve into the ambulance, and he's talking. The family is talking to him, letting him know that they'll be right behind him. I look up at the night sky, smiling. Thank you. Thank you for that. I key up the mic, hand steady once again. Revolve 9, control. Ambulance has the patient, en route to hospital. I'll be back in service. End of story. Plastic Bricks, written by Eddie Eddie. When we got our human crew members, we were all made aware of the changes that would happen. New foods would be added to the roster, some of which we couldn't eat due to the spices used, and that there were certain foods that we had that we could not give the humans for the same reason. However, the strangest changes were those that were done with the recreation room. There were several new things added. A large set of shapeless sacks that seemed to conform to those who sat in them. A large table covered in cloth. The edges were raised as if to prevent things from falling off, but had irregular gaps along the edge. The strangest, however, were added to the advisory of the Human Interaction Council on Earth. A large open space with a raised platform around it, and several dozen large crates were placed in the same space. Each crate had labels. Some seemed to simply have measurements. However, there were no units given, such as 2x3 plate, 
while some had long and complex names, such as Axelpin with friction ridges lengthwise. No one was really sure what on earth these were. When the humans were introduced to the group, they seemed rather normal, at least, for such a strange species. They did their jobs well and kept to themselves, mostly. It took them a few days for them to discover the space set aside for the crates. One of the humans let out a yell of glee and held up something from one of the boxes. It looked like a small plastic cube. The response from the other two humans was to rush over and they started opening the crates and shouting at each other and holding up handfuls of brightly colored plastic shapes. The other crew members looked on in utter confusion. The shapes looked like some sort of toys we'd used to teach children the basic shapes and the fundamentals of geometry. The humans, however, utterly gleeful about them and started pressing the shapes together. Most of the crew dismissed this as humans being humans, a primitive race that found joy in basic things. A few, however, watched as the humans dragged over the shapeless sack chairs and set about pushing the shapes together in ever more complex manners. The shapes appeared to stick together and the humans clearly were up to something with them. Days passed and the humans kept going back to the plastic shapes. They'd often stop and do other things, but they'd always go back and resume whatever they were working on. They'd found other crates full of stranger shapes than the basic bricks. Slope bits or cross-shaped long thin ones, even gears and other basic mechanical devices. Myself and one of the other crew members had found that watching the humans work on these plastic shapes was quite entertaining as they would often lose or forget a bit and spend a while looking for it. We also learned to the plethora of human swear words when one of the humans stepped on a brick without his shoes on. One day, we walked into the recreation area and saw up on the raised wall a structure. It was a copy of the ship, made out of tiny plastic shapes. Myself and the other crew who had watched the humans rushed over and started to examine this tiny copy of the ship. It was amazing. The detail was so intricate and accurate. There was even a main command deck visible through clear plastic of the command deck's windows. We spent quite a while marveling at the copy before one of the humans looked up from what they were doing and spotted us. The human took the time to show us all the extra details of the model, including the functioning cargo bay doors. He was so confused. How could such a simple thing as plastic shapes do all of this? The human offered to show us what they were doing and teach us. My companion agreed and was invited to join the human inside the raised wall to get their first lesson. I simply sat down and started to watch didn't take long for my crewmates to be entranced by whatever these cubes were. It was a little longer before they came over to me, carrying a crude structure. It was identifiable as a copy of a house on a homeworld, but it was made of dozens of different colors and had no windows or doors. It was the most basic representation, but my crewmate seemed very pleased with himself. I didn't realize it at the time, but after a few days I noticed that my crewmate had become like the humans, constantly investing time into these strange plastic shapes. He couldn't convey why it was so engrossing, but he insisted that it was worth his time. As days passed, his constructs became more and more recognizable and advanced, matching colors and shapes. Slowly, the humans and my crew member pulled up the raised area with small copies of other things. Animals, birds, vehicles. There was even a copy of a data pad that caused confusion for at least two crew members when they attempted to use it. The real shock, however, came when I came to the recreation area, only to hear a racket of clacking and clicking and the sounds of small motors whirring. It didn't take long to locate the source. 
set about the human's little area of plastic shapes was well over 40 small mechanical devices that were moving little plastic balls from one to another using each different method. Some were throwing the balls, others were picking them up and carrying them. Some had rotating lifting devices, others were using mechanical stepping systems. There were more than I could track and once I started looking, it was very hard to stop following the balls along their endless journey around the chain of machines. It took a long time to realize that I had looped the entire structure at least twice. I finally tore myself away to ask the humans about what was going on, and they explained to me that they decided to make what they called a ball contraption, and it had gotten out of hand. I noticed my crewmate busy fiddling with another one of these constructions. When it looked crude next to the humans, it was undeniable that it was far superior to the ones he'd started out with. It was only when the humans offered to teach anyone who wanted to know what they were doing and how to do it that we discovered just how much fun these little plastic shapes could be, and why the humans loved them so much. Supposedly, they were a children's toy, but with the limitations on complexity being only limited by how ingenious you could be with the little blocks, there was no reason not to build grand constructs or tiny intricate machines. It didn't help that it was far more difficult than it looked to get all of it working. Eventually, the entire crew petitioned the captain for even more of these, um, Legos to be provided to the ship. We're planning on going to the next Lego convention, as the humans call it, as the first interspecies ball contraption. End of story. Story number two. Word prompt. Aliens invade Earth. They lose. But it appears humanity accidentally committed some intergalactic war crimes. Written by Cal Bynes. What did you expect when you don't tell someone the rules they can't be expected to follow them? The representative responded to the senators. Well, uh, we didn't even need to. Usually, most civilizations didn't have the capabilities to do the sort of things you did, much less disregard of, of any reasonable standards to use it. The tall, four-legged alien countered. The Heritzian had all the time in the galaxy to research us. If they would have done any looking, they'd have seen we not only acted with restraint, but have already used it on ourselves before. The only reason we used it again was the fact that our very existence was threatened. She yelled at them, rolling up the images of the swaths of the planet taken over by the insectoids that had taken over in the months before they began using a full extent of their arms. You could have surrendered at any time. The Heritzian constantly told you they would accept any surrender. Another representative popped in, a tall, mineral-like creature. And surrender our people to the wrath of some alien group. You saw what our soldiers would do before capture and interrogation. What did you expect would happen once you started progressing even further? The human turned onto the rock creature. A loud bang sounded across the room, silencing everyone as a large robotic figure within it holding in its minds of this alpha race. Silence! No matter the circumstances, you and your people shall be sentenced for violating the basic principles this galaxy rests upon. Your people shall be forced to labor for the species for which the rights of your kind has violated. This voice said and boomed throughout the chamber, with some representatives near fainting from the voice, not often heard except for dying circumstances. The human stayed still, staring at the gargantuan figure in the eyes. All people will serve no one. You should have learned that by now. Try and subjugate us again, and you will learn that our chemicals are the least of your worries. She said, slamming the doors that she had entered behind her. And I'll... Danetta Freeman, written by H2J1977. Two Galoians sat at a table in the corner of the galley of the Colchian Vishlak, a commercial freighter deep in Galoyan space, haunched together, talking quietly. Rickle was two meters tall and half that wide. Wex was slightly smaller, 
and both had reddish skin with a light brown fur ringing the shoulders and covering their forearms, the colors marking them as labor caste members of their species. Their heads were bald and their faces resembled an earth vulture, but with a large forward-facing eyes like an owl. Wex picked up his sturdy metal cup with his four-clawed hand, tipped it towards Reckle, saying, I'm telling you, Reckle, Danetta Freeman is the toughest being on the ship. If you saw what I did on the security hollows, you'd understand. Reckle flexed his claws and clicked his beak several times, laughing. Wex, she's about as tough as the stuffed Zvax that you probably kept in your nest as a fledgling. I scrapped Nurians off the hull of my last freighter that put up more of a fight than she could. Reckle, you just joined the crew a few months ago. You weren't here when she lost her arm in an accident, Vex said, scrunching his head down into the fur cowl around his shoulders just thinking about the incident. We were running a shipment of unprocessed metals from Gapta to Eurosta 3. It was only a three-day trip with the Spraytor's sublight engines. About six hours in, we started experiencing fluctuations in one of the engines. The captain sent her and one of the Honari engineers, Froya, down to check it out. Danetta, being chief engineer, sent Froya down to the lower level of the engine room to check the pressure levels and get a first-hand look at things, while she did diagnostics from the command console. Reckle scratched his fur patch on his arm absent-mindedly. Is a story going somewhere, Vex? Just setting the scene, Reckle. I've been taking a course on the QNet on how to tell stories like humans. They all tell stories in such fascinating ways, unlike the lions. There was a ball on the floor. I picked it up and put it away. The end. So dull. So boring. Anyway, using the command console, Danetta found an overload in one of the plasma conduits. She had just opened the access hatch when Floyer climbed back up from the lower level in the engine room. He was snooped down with his data pad, making notes, and didn't see the conduit hatch on the floor. It's common knowledge that the Hanari aren't the most coordinated beings, and Floyer was no exception. His boot caught the side of the hatch, and he just launched himself right into Danetta. He knocked her backwards and into an open access hatch as he went face first into the bulkhead, knocking himself out. Seeing that Reckle's eyes were now focused on him, Wax continued. He comes about five minutes later, and Danetta is dragging him down the central passageway, heading towards Sick Bay. Keep in mind that Foyer is probably 182 centimeters and weighs close to 105 kilos. Danetta is what? 165, max, and no more than 61 kilos soaking wet. Reckel squinted his eyes a bit, trying to calculate what it would take for him to duplicate Danetta's feet of strength. Those were some big numbers. He was certain he was up to it, but it was still impressive for such a small and frail. Being. Go on, Reckle said, realizing that he was actually getting wrapped up in Wax's story. So Froyer starts pulling himself up, only to have Danetta push him right back down onto his rump. She tells him to sit still and let her check him over. She's the boss, so he sits, and his eyes finally get their focus back, and he's watching Danetta check him over. She's looking into his eyes, flashing a pen light into them. She asks him how many fingers she's holding up. She says you've got a nasty cut on your eye ridge, and it looks like your snoot cartilage may be broken. Oh, it was three, in case you were wondering. Then she struggles to pull out a canister of derma paste and puts some on the cut on his eye ridge. She says to him, okay, I think you're probably fine. I don't think you have a concussion, but let's have the doc check you out anyway. He asks her to give him a hand up, and he reaches out to grab hers. He misses. That's when he realizes that she was missing her left arm below the elbow. Instead, there was just a cleanly severed blackened stump. She looks at him. I'm telling you. She just looks at him stone cold in the eyes and says, Plasma stream beats flesh. 
Let's go to sickbay. Floyer starts freaking out. He cracks and pukes right there in the middle of the passage. There he is curling up, knees to chest, blood dripping out of his snout, crying and cursing himself for being so clumsy. As she just kisses him on the forehead, she grabs him by the jowls with her one hand, looks him in the eyes and says, It's okay, Floyer. Really, it'll all be okay. It was an accident. I forgive you, but I need to get to sick bay. The adrenaline is starting to wear off and this is gonna hurt like a hell in a minute. Rickle just stared at his left arm. How could a being just shrug off losing an arm like that? How the cracks did she manage to drag a being twice her size with only one arm? Moreover, how'd she do it right after having it burned off? Rekel was certain that he had his arm obliterated and cauterized by a plasma stream. He'd have been unconscious right alongside Floyer. What happened next? Right, Wex said. She pulls him up, wraps her arm around his waist, and walks him the rest of the way until they get to sick bay. Dr. Nguyen sees them, and he starts asking them what happened, and practically shoves Denetta into the closest med pod. Before Denetta can even finish her sentence, he hits her with a sedative, and she's out, cold. Floyer is there, and he's so traumatized, all he can say is, Plasma stream beats flesh over and over. Then Doc gives him something too, to calm him down. A few minutes later, Froya manages to tell the Doc everything. He says to him, You have to fix her up, Doc. This is on me. I've got to make this right. The Doc starts a neural block for the severed arm and wakes Danetta back up. He tells her she's got two options. They can start cloning her a replacement arm, or they can fit her with a cybernetic arm. Danetta looks at him and says, which one gets me back to work the fastest? She's just been shoved into an open plasma stream, become an amputee, dragged an unconscious Hanari 300 meters one-handed, and she's worried about getting back to work. That's insane. Rekel blinks rapidly and nods his head in agreement. It really was insane and beyond impressive. Dr. Nguyen tells her that they can 3D print and program a fully articulated cybernetic arm in about two hours, and she could be back at work in six weeks of physical therapy. Or they could take a day or two to clone an arm, another day to surgically attach it, and she'd be as good as new in a month. But she chose the cybernetic arm, Wax, Reckles said. I've seen it. I've never asked about it because I don't know her that well. You're right. She did choose the cybernetic arm, Wex said, but she chose it because she had no intention of waiting six weeks for physical therapy. As soon as she got the arm fitted and fully neurally integrated, she went to the captain and told him she was going back to work, and unless he wanted a grievous workplace injury lawsuit, he would get the doctor to sign off on it. Needless to say, she finished the trip at her station. Reckle felt like Wex just pulled back a curtain on one of the secrets of the universe. He'd heard rumors about how resilient humans were before, but all the stories had been a third or fourth hand, and hardly believable. But here, through Wex's first-hand account, it had all been confirmed. I think you're right, Wex. Danetta is the toughest being on this crew. She may be the toughest being that I ever met. Wex clicked his beak, laughing slightly. Oh, that's just the edge of the planetary ring. Let me tell you about the time she broke an Autarian's nose and three of his fingers after he slapped her butt in a bar on Eurista 3. End of story.
the story. Story number one. Culture and Cuisines, written by Dr. Muffin, Ph.D. Slast grimaced as his body collapsed into the chair. The fear and frantic energy that he had felt upon first seeing the morning's local news headline was gone, replaced by a crushing feeling of inevitability. Almost without thinking about it, Slas pulled up the article of his combat. Acquisition of the TRIT by the GSSC falls apart in the last-minute negotiations. The article went on to describe how the seemingly surefire acquisition of Trisk Intersolar Transit by the Girl Station Company had imploded, apparently due to a mutual stubbornness and overinflated egos on both sides. Slas's whiskers drooped further in resignation. He had already spoken to everyone he thought could possibly help. First, to confirm that the news was correct. No was. And then, to see if he could cancel any of the contracts to recover some of his investment. He couldn't. Slas looked around, taking in the comfortable Trisk furnishings. Maddock wood chairs, turek styled tables, and, of course, the traditional Surhi oven and prep area in the center of the establishment. Everything had been ready for a grand opening, which was supposed to be just three cycles away. He had poured his life savings into this restaurant, and now it was doomed to be an abject failure before it ever opened. It had seemed like such a safe bet. The only other place in the Gull Station that served Trisk's food was the Low Dock Worker Cafeteria, and the quality was subpar at best. Of course, none of that mattered now. Only a handful of Trisk, including himself, lived on the station, and a few regularly passed through. A large number of Trisk would have moved to Gull Station in the coming days under the acquisition, but that wasn't happening now. Slas reached for the compad and placed a call to the service manager that he had hired. She was a human, a race which was fairly new to the galactic fold, but who had quickly spread throughout the galaxy and established a reputation as bold explorers. They already had significant presence on Gull Station. Slas had heard the tendency to wonder was due to the nomadic evolutionary history. Regardless, he had needed someone to manage the day-to-day -day of the business and to hire workers when the restaurant opened, and she had come highly recommended. Oh, hey, more Sloss. What's up? Hello, Sarah. Sloss balls for a moment. It was still strange to him that humans did not place any signifier in the title before the name when speaking with others. His own title more indicated that he was a skilled chef back home on Triscan. I trust that you've seen the news this morning. Without the acquisition, there is no longer any need for servers or cleaners. Could you please contact the staff that you've hired and tell them the restaurant is closing? Wait, 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 Sarah said. Closing? How can it be closing? We haven't even opened yet. Besides, you've poured your heart and soul into this thing. How can you just shut it down like that? As I said... The merger between the Trisk Interstellar and the station fell through. There is no reason for Trisk to move to the station anymore. The restaurant is doomed. How is it doomed just because there aren't any Trisk? Sarah asked. Slas felt his whiskers wiggle in a slight irritation. I understand that humans have spread widely and rapidly. So perhaps you don't experience this problem as frequently as other species. But it's impossible for a restaurant to survive without a reasonable number of the cuisine's client species in the area. Why is that? Sarah asked again. Slas's ears cocked up in exasperation. Humans really were a naive species. Because every species eats their own food, obviously. Trisk eat Trisk cuisine, Sa eats our cuisine, and I'm sure that humans eat human cuisine. You'll never see a Sa eating Chak's food. Without a merger, we won't have enough clients to survive. Even if every Trisk on the station comes to the restaurant twice a cycle. Simply put, the restaurant is doomed. For a moment, Slas wondered how anyone could have recommended that he hire Sarah, given her lack of basic restaurant knowledge. There was a brief pause on the compad. Well, um, actually, 
Sarah began. Looking around his restaurant, Slas could hardly believe it. It was twelve cycles since he had read about the failed acquisition, and three since he had opened his restaurant doors. The place was packed. He could hardly keep up with the orders. He might even have to hire another more trisk, just to help out with the cooking. More surprisingly, only a few of the customers were trisk. Nearly all of them were humans eager to see what Trisk Cuisine had to offer. Sarah walked up to him with a large human smile. A sight Slaas had come to love in the last few days. See, what did I tell you? She boasted. I admit I had my doubts, Slaas replied. But to think that humans can not only eat the vast majority of other species' cuisine, but they enjoy it so much they seek out different cuisines on purpose. It's completely unheard of. Humans have always been adventurous eaters, she laughed. Perhaps it is because of your species' nomadic past, Stas offered. Or maybe we like to wander and explore because we love the experience of new things, Sarah replied. May I? she asked, pointing towards the freshly made docky bun, hot out of the oven. Of course. Sarah popped a small bun into her mouth and smiled. Delicious. End of story. Story number two. All System Science University. Bad Vacation Spot. Written by Apophis Pegasus. Angling his senses at the sky, Voss wobbled in contentment. Parasia was lovely this time of cycle, and the planet's twin suns beat down on his ship's form, bathing him in a pleasantly warm glow a welcome contrast to the relative frigidity of outer space. Hopefully the three humans who had contracted him would stay for a week, maybe two, and the Ingen could get his own little vacation. Bask in the sun, surf in Vorasia's data net. Heck, he had an android body in storage. Maybe he might take a walk around the village. His contentment was swiftly cut short by the beeping of his communicator. Checking the ID, he saw that it was Hans, one of the humans who had rented his services. Strange. It had only been four hours, and I shouldn't be calling so soon. Brrrt. Click. Hello? Start the ship, start the ship, start the ship, start the freaking ship. What? Oh, calm down. What's going on? we are coming in hot, man. Get ready. What are you talking about? Boss was interrupted by an alert on his proximity sensor, coming from the southwest. Angling his senses in the general direction, he was confronted with the three running forms of Hans, Kevin, and Rick about a kilometer out, and close on their tail was what looked like the entire population of the village that they were staying at. Quickly accessing the data net, he pulled up the local news feeds, fear rising up with each headline. Human males spotted in Nyado Resort. Transport ticket purchases skyrocket planet-wide. Property damage reports flood in after humans spur massive disturbance. Subminister Val Antenzana states there will be severe repercussions if any human is permanently injured. Human men have landed. Get them while they're fresh. Tips and tricks for netting a human. Crap. Voss started the ship's engines quickly and ran through the emergency diagnostics. Fuel? Check. Power? Check. Stabilizers? Check. Not bothering to do the security sweep in the interest of time, he started hovering the ship a few feet off the ground. Just as the three humans jumped into the ship's edgeway, a mob of Eurasians right behind them. Slamming the door shut, Kevin turned to the ship's control console with a look of terror. Go! Go, 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 go! G-forces slammed the humans into the ground as Voss eagerly complied, accelerating straight up. Within a minute, he was in the upper atmosphere, where he let up, allowing the humans to get up painfully. Hans fumed as he sat in a chair, nursing his bruises, while Kevin and Rick slumped, thankfully. Those arseholes! What? Um, guys, Hans continued, Hate them, Jim and Ishta, Kevin. They said Parisians liked humans, not that they were all freaking insane. Got claw marks on me, for God's sake. Yeah, they should have probably given us the heads up. 
but it was your idea to go, even after what happened to Brad. Guys, Brad's a dick. We didn't do anything wrong. We just went to the pool. Yeah, come to think of it, they all seemed a little on edge from the moment we got here. Guys! The two of them turned to look at Rick, who had a shaking hand pointed at the corner. I think we have a stowaway. An energy cannon popped out from the hidden compartment, and Voss leveled it at the dark figure as the three men shrunk back. Come out with your hands where I can see them. The figure that stepped out of the shadows was clearly a voracious, nearly seven feet tall. Its muscular form was covered in a sheen of silvery gray fur. Gold and iron burn circled locks in its hair, reflecting the lights as it stepped forward. Clawed hands raised, stark white eyes glimmering in fear, when there was something off about this one. Hands narrowed his eyes in disbelief. Wait, are you a guy? The Phrasian nodded vigorously and made a slow, calming motion with his hands as he replied. Look, I know this looks bad, but uh, I'll pay everything I have to if you take me with you. Everyone on that planet is blob farking crazy. End of story. And, uh, and now, on to the story. Story number one, A Warrior's Death, written by Echoing Cascade. The death of men entered the terrifying truth. The bar where all the deaths of sentience throughout the universe met to talk and get their hands, pseudopods, tentacles, claws, and other appendages on a cold drink. The death of man was given a wide berth. He used to be mocked for the training he did in his off hours and the multitude of weapons he carried in the hammer space inside of his cloak. That was until he allowed a few of his peers to follow him into the human war a few centuries ago. The rules of the various deaths were quite simple. They appeared in person only to the dying soldiers on a battlefield and to females who were about to die during childbirth. They had earned the right to be reaped in person. The deaths would appear to them in a place between the swill and the neck and end their mortal lives so that they could move on. The war he took the other deaths to was a small affair by human standards. Only a couple million had perished. This alone terrified the deaths of the more passive species who didn't see this quantity of casualties in centuries. But what followed terrified even the deaths of the proud warrior races. When the death of men approached the dying soldiers, there was the usual mix of reactions. Fear, shock, and serenity brought by knowing that the fighting was done. They allowed death to simply swing his scythe and go to their afterlife. But that was not all. Some did not look at death with fear or reverence. No, some looked angry, furious, and from the depths of their souls conjured weapons they wielded in life had charged. Former enemies and allies alike trying to kill, well, death itself. The death of men grinned, not that he could pull many other expressions, and drew from his cloak a long sword and a short axe as his scythe of office disappeared. The fight was short and the soldiers fell to the eternal rest in a couple of swings. Death of men, you see, they do not always allow themselves to be reaped. Sometimes they fight back. I blame that one human who said something about not going gently into that good planetary rotation or something. The other deaths nodded. They were used to fear, all being welcomed and the odd begging, but austerity, and the fact that they wielded weapons. No one made fun of the death of men after that. The death of men had come into the bar after a hard day of work. The Strally had declared war on a human colony. The Marines deployed them had given their transport to evacuate civilians and had chosen to stay and fight. A hundred Marines fought 4,000 Strally. A little over 2,000 Strally remained when the dust settled. It had come to reap the Marines when things got uh, complicated. The death of men appeared in front of the Marines. Captain Cross, you and your soldiers fought well, but it is time to lay down your arms and go to your just reward. Captain Cross was not a religious man, but
but seeing a cloaked, skeletal figure, wielding a scythe, and all his men he had previously seen torn to shreds and mutilated stand in perfect uniform, was something even he could hardly ignore. What happens now? Death of men. It is not for me to decide. I am but a reaper. I earned lives. I do no more and no less. Captain Cross nodded and looked at his men. They had certainly earned their rest, every last one of them. Wait, not all of them. Can anyone see Drake, Vasquez, or Willard? The soldiers present looked around, and after a moment, the answer came back. They were not here. Death of men. I have not reaped them yet. They are running away from the Strali, as you had ordered. They have complete records of the engagements they are to deliver to high command. Captain Cross, not reap them yet. The death of men knew what was going to happen next. He'd seen it before. I could always lie, he thought to himself for a second, but he couldn't. Death of men, there is an order to these things. I cannot reap them until I've reaped you all. Captain Cross had been looking old, grey and tired, but was now young and in his prime. His pristine uniform started to fade. Is that right? The uniform was now completely gone. In its place, his old battered armor, sword, and pulse pistol clothed him like a regalia of a warrior king. The death of men didn't need to look at the other soldiers to know the same was happening to them. Before we begin, you should know that a day here is but a second where those three are. The marines didn't hear or didn't care. They were already attacking. Vasquez was the last surviving member of his unit. The two other had stood their ground to give him more time. He was always the fastest, and he was now running for the communication center. He had a job to do, and he would complete it no matter what. He made it to the console. He was downloading the data in his armor and was about to send it to high command. This would be more than enough to earn them an edge when they faced the Strali. Before the wound on his chest could kill him, he pushed the final button to send the file, and he could have sworn he saw a cloaked figure in the corner of his eye, arms crossed, leaning against the wall. The 97 marines had earned 10 seconds and 9 tenths of a second. It took Vasquez, Drake, and Willard 11 seconds flat to finish their work. The death of men took his glass and looked at it solemnly and smiled to himself. So I rounded up. No law against that. He finished his drink and went back home. Today, he would focus on his footwork. Men of Story Story number two. M.A.D. Written by Mean Gator Humanity was the last one to join the galactic community. Community... It was more like an ancient far west. It was good fortune for us that we discovered FTL drives very late, so we have considerable advanced technology in our hands. We are not that powerful to draw a coalition against us, but powerful enough to give second thoughts to anyone not having the better of intentions. The dream of joining the community died in its tracks. It was kill, not be killed, eat, not be eaten. Unfortunately, we got the attention of the Jazen. It's an irony. By the physical appearance of one of the most dangerous species, it was not like a feverish nightmare. They were not lizards. They were not insectoids. They were humanoids. Beautiful, elven-like humanoids. Jazen were considerably more advanced technologically and way more powerful. We would have no luck in a full confrontation. But humans were not naive to these kinds of games. You see, almost every species was unified long before they left the planet for the first time. Humans, on the other hand, were not unified even after discovering FTL. Our solar system has the same violent history as our planet. The only reason that we hadn't blown ourselves to kingdom come was the same reason that we didn't annihilate ourselves in a nuclear inferno. Back when we all lived on old Earth. M.A.D. Mutually Assured Destruction. The Jazen were to get a hard lesson that humans don't frick around with retaliating. 
It's good to learn for your mistakes. It's even better to learn from the mistakes of others. The whole galactic community will have today this the chance to learn from Johnson's mistake. Do not frick with humans. I am alone in the cockpit. I'm not riding on my spaceship. It's not my spaceship. It's a nova bomb that'll dive deep into Jarzen's home system star and create a wormhole that'll destabilize the core. I look at the photo of my family, my husband, and my two kids. Our colony was used by Jarzen as an example. My family long dead. I volunteered to use their own freaking homeworld to make an even more severe example. Break with us, and we are going to break with you back, not in the tenfold, not in the hundredfold, but to a thousandfold, to a ten thousandfold. I was deep in their son's core. My time had come. I pumped up the vibe. I wouldn't go silently into the dark. When you're brought into this world, they say that you're born in sin. Well, at least they gave me something. I didn't have to steal or have to win. Well, they'll tell me I'm wanted. Yeah, I'm a wanted man. I'm a cult in your stable. I'm what came was to Abel. Mr. Catch me if you can. I press the button. I'm going out in a blaze of glory. Take me now, but know the truth. I'm going out in a blaze of glory. Moments later, the blaze of a new supernova lit the galaxy. End of story. On to the story. Story number one. The Feather Right Incident, written by C-SPAN. People sometimes say that the most dangerous human emotion is anger. They'll tell you stories of humans destroying things in fits of rage, and the consequences that follow. Others will tell you that the most dangerous human emotion is hatred, and tell tales of obsessive humans dedicating their lives to making the object of their hatred absolutely miserable. Yet others will insist that the most dangerous human emotion is actually pride, and describe the inane lengths humans will go to in order to satisfy their own vanity. I am here to tell you they're all wrong, and that the most dangerous human emotion is pure, unadulterated glee. Now, many of you are probably thinking that glee seems like a relatively harmless emotion, and surely I must be exaggerating its impact. And in most cases, you would be right. Under normal circumstances, human glee is a wonderful emotion. But I'm not talking about normal human glee. I'm talking about the glee of a human engineer, which is the most frightening thing that I have ever encountered. Because when a human engineer is gleeful, it means that something they built started to work. And that is absolutely terrifying. Gather round, my new friends, and let me tell you a tale of the Feather Right incident. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of the Feather Right incident before but likely through either a history textbook or tales so distorted by the retelling that they're more fiction than fact. But I was there. My friends, I was on the Featherite, and my tale is the truth. The incident, funny enough, was started partially by me. I was the security officer on board the Featherite at the time, in part due to my level-headedness during a crisis but mostly because I massed twice as much as the next largest crewmate and was capable of physically restraining anyone else on board. Not that I needed to. Most incidents about the Feather Right were exactly what you would expect to board a long-haul freighter. Drunken brawls and lovers' quarrels. I know the concept of a long-haul freighter doesn't really exist anymore. But back then, you needed someone to keep the peace on journeys that could last months, if not years. Anyways, my role in the incident began with a call down to Engineering Bay to check on a certain Joan Matrovsky. Yes, that Joan Matrovsky. She was just a crew member at the time, of course, and I was called down because she was making strange noises and scaring some of the more sensitive engineers. 
When I arrived in engineering, she seemed to be reaching the end of a fit that had overtaken her, and I was barely certain that she was laughing. I gently ushered her to the side and asked what was going on. She explained that a major breakthrough had occurred in a project that she had been working on, and that she was simply happy that she had made progress. She then asked to speak to the captain. The look on her face, as some of you have doubtless already guessed, was pure glee. I should have stopped her. I should have known that the slightly manic grin she wore was a harping of a great and terrible events that were to come. I should have congratulated her on her achievement, denied her to see the captain, and maybe had the ship's doctor check on her for good measure. But I was young, dumb, and overconfident. At the time, I was able to read human emotion well enough to grasp that she was happy, and, in my naivete, thought that happy engineer was always a good thing. So I granted a request to see the captain, and tagged along simply because I wanted to hear the conversation the two of them would have. Long haul flights were almost aggressively boring most of the time, and any reason to break my routine was a welcome distraction. Which is why I was on the bridge when Joan excitedly told our captain that she believed she could tweak our engines to get us to our destination much faster. I was really only able to translate Joan's side of the conversation. Our captain communicated through highly directional bursts of pheromones. But the point was, as far as I could tell, that Joan could get us to port in roughly half the time if she had a week to work on the engines. The captain must have agreed, because she thanked them and darted off the bridge wearing a mad grin. I am not able to tell you the mechanics of what she did, and I doubt any of you are capable of understanding anyways. But within a week, Joan's modifications were complete, and she gave the go-ahead to jump. Everyone, Joan included, thought this would simply be a faster jump. So nobody was sedated at the time. I am one of the select group of incredibly unfortunate individuals that has gone through the Matrovsky jump conscious. It was, and will forever be, the worst pain that I have ever felt in my entire life. Every single nerve ending firing at once results in indescribable agony. I've been shot, stabbed, poisoned, and burnt in my time but none of that even comes close to the pain of a Matrovsky jump. It was a single second that felt like an eternity. After that brief, horrible instant, roughly half of the crew was dead or in need of serious medical attention, and the other half was in serious shock. Fortunately, the ship's doctor was relatively okay, so after a few hours of chaotic triage, everyone on the ship was mostly stable. It was at that point that we began to take our bearings and found out just how magnificently screwed we were. We were well outside the galactic disk, farther than anyone had ever been before. It would take years using the conventional drive technology to reach us, assuming anyone knew where we were. Our only chance of survival was the same experimental drive modification that had gotten us into this mess in the first place. Salvation came in the form of Joe, who was fortunately still alive and capable of coherent thought. If she hadn't been, we all would have died slow deaths of starvation as our food supplies ran out. But fortunately, for everyone still alive on board, she was capable of figuring out what had happened and was able to get us home. Joan needed to decipher what she had done and determine how to tune it so that we would end up in a close vicinity of civilization when we jumped home. She worked like a woman possessed, functioning entirely off catnaps and increasingly stronger stimulants. It took her a month. That month was easily the worst that I had ever spent on any ship. Only a tenuous hope of salvation, as well as the lingering shock of the jump, prevented the crew from tearing each other apart. I think I slept as little as Joan did, 
trying to maintain some semblance of shipboard discipline. After that terrible month, Joan announced that she was finished, and we prepared to make the return jump. We knew that it would probably kill or cripple some of the remaining crew, but we had no other choice. I imagine it was with a sense of great regret that the captain gave the order to jump. The trip home was worse. On the way out, we were caught entirely off guard by the absolutely agonizing pain, and it obliterated all semblance of rational thought. On the way back, because I was a little better prepared, I retained some awareness of my surroundings. And I saw things, terrible things, beings that lived in the space between dimensions, fractal geometries and quantum effects made flesh. Beings whom the laws of reality were little more than suggestions. Beings that were not pleased by our intrusion into their home, however brief it may have been. The medical and scientific consensus is that anything anyone sees going through the Matrovsky jump, conscious, is merely hallucinations caused by misfiring synapses. But I know what I saw. Of the 218 crew members who made the second jump, 46 emerged with the faculties intact. All but one reported seeing something out in the dark, if only for an instant. It is my firm belief that there are things in this universe stranger than we can even comprehend, and it is probably best to leave them well enough alone. Anyways, as I'm sure you already know, the Featherite emerged in a dangerously low orbit around a highly populated world. The incident and the incredible technology discovered by it dominated news cycles for weeks. Incidentally, medical workers treated the survivors of the Featherite noticed that the crew members who had been placed in medical comas due to their injuries had sustained no additional damage from the second jump. Further testing confirmed that as long as you were unconscious during the jump, the effects of your psyche were minimal. Joan, of course, survived both jumps and proceeded to become tremendously wealthy as a result of her invention. The Featherite incident is remembered as a turning point in interstellar travel and revolutionized transports as we know it. So, in a way, I helped usher in a new era of spaceflight by being an unwitting test pilot for an experimental drive. That's uh, worth a beer or two, right? And remember, if you ever see a gleeful human engineer, run. End of story. Story number two. Diplomatic Chairs, written by Eddie Andy. Diplomatic meetings in the galactic community are never easy. Each species has unique traditions, traits, and requirements. He can't see Teoluchi on any position that contains the numbers four and seven, because those are the cursed numbers. But you don't want them next to the Zhacha, because they fight like skeevels in a bag. Meals are also a pain. You cannot serve meat as some of the prey races paint at the sight of it. However, some species consider it a delicacy, so you need to uh, hide the meat. Some species' food is toxic to others, so they cannot mix. And then there are the almost unlimited combinations of sauces and other things to be wary of. Cutlery is also a pain. Just one meal takes over eight months of planning. It gets even worse at high council meetings. You can't use a circular table because the Jolna finds circles insulting to be around as there are no defined end, indicating the meeting should go on forever. But that means that certain seats need to be considered so specific species and empires don't feel subbed. Seats. Don't even get me started on seats, specific styles, sizes, materials, and even colors. It's insane. Then there's the issue of if the diplomat is bigger or smaller than expected. It was a nightmare. I say it was because of you humans, you blasted humans, and your, uh, what do you call them, 
sacks of diplomatic communication. Those things saved us so much effort. Just big fabric or plastic sacks full of soft beads. Any species could use them. And even better, the only thing that matters is the size. You can change anything else without much trouble. We've had to start limiting the use of them as people want to use them for personal use. Can you imagine diplomatic thrones being used as common sitting implements? What a pointless waste. Not to mention, having such universal chairs is so useful because no one feels left out. Admittedly, when the Ulian ambassador had to be helped out of his chair, it was funny. Now, can we sort out an order of 40 of the medium-sized ones and uh, 20 large? What was the slang that you used? Oh, beanbag. End of story. Story number one. Neutron stars are forever. Written by Lane Mella. Alonco had been preparing for this moment for longer than he cared to think about. A deep cover agent for the industrial Sahal. He had trained for years to get where he was. Painful surgeries and physical therapy. Makeup and piles of research combed through every tiny detail. He knew to stifle the instinctive urge to arch his lower limbs at the need of a tour. It was so inefficient to limit himself only to his upper digits. Although having five fingers instead of two was extremely nice, he had to admit. Learning to use the things properly had been nightmare-inducing. He still had horror dreams about trying to learn to use the chopsticks in particular. Fortunately, many humans could not master the skill either, so he had not flunked out when he had failed that part of the exam. It wasn't that surprising, actually. Anatomy changes like this were an expensive procedure, and he had already been partially trained on how to use five fingers with a brain that was wired for two by the time that they had reached that point. At least humans seem to have a large range of behaviors and cultures, so Alanka need only focus on perfecting one. He was one of the few fake human moles who chose to go with something other than American, though. It was probably the easiest to emulate, being very open to strangeness because of mixing a part of cultures, as well as a penchant for being allowed and generally oblivious to the societal norms of other countries. He still picked an English-speaking country, so that he could practice and strange syllables with his peers, and he watched archives worth of classic movies to perfect his Bristol accent. That combined with the meek demeanor and the penchant for being wallflower for a while, and he'd be able to go where he liked. For the glory of Sahal, he would do as generations of spies had done before him when a new species hit the galactic stage. He would collect data and protect the collective. This wasn't even the most extreme change that he had seen in the textbooks, although forward-facing eyes had been odd. Blinking at the correct rate had also taken copious amounts of practice, as well as suppressing his inner eyelid. At this point, he might as well buy stock in the company that made seeding solution. He went through it at an alarming speed. He had a small capsule for context to explain the seeding to the humans as well. Although, the thought of actually inserting little bits of glass into his eyes made him shiver. Even after all the mods he'd been through, such a primitive method was absolutely petrifying to contemplate. Humans were so unsanitary and needlessly archaic. He tugged at the too tight collar at the strange rags that the humans were fond of. He wasn't certain exactly what the function that Tai posed, just that it was a custom, but tight. Well, this was day one of his assignment. He supposed eventually it would be just more of an uncomfortable thing on top of another million. He no longer felt like a Sahol, but neither did he feel quite human, stuck in a strange limbo he didn't quite know how to feel about. He did, however, feel prepared. He knew he was ready. All of his training had led him to these few glorious moments. 
Yet, anxiety still surged as well as he could carefully started mentally reciting the correct instructions for making tea for the millionth time. Half practice, half distraction. Boil the water. One tea bag per person and then one for the pot. Warm the pot and the cups with the hot water rinse. Add near boiling water and don't forget your tea cozy. Steep for five minutes. Pour, then add the milk. Crush. Whoosh. He slammed into a human hat. Papers he was grasping flew everywhere. He slid a bit across the floor and winced. He was going to feel that later. The human rocked back on its heels, then steadied itself. And a gore immediately stood to his feet with a brush at it off, offering his usual mild manner apology. Internally, he was cursing himself. Everything straining his muscles as he kept it from his face. He was awkwardly scooping up the white papers that the humans used. So wasteful. Both species had gone fully digital over a century ago. But this was a military installation. And strictly speaking, he wasn't really supposed to be here even as a human self. If he was caught, he'd be in deep crap from both of his new human boss and his old Sir Hull one as well. What did the human spies say? Vrek. Yes. Vrek was a good term for how Alan Cor was feeling right now. The copious amounts of paper had worked as a distraction and partially as a shield, but his lack of attention had turned it into the greatest nightmare. This was a soldier, a human, staring at him, probably with suspicion. Although he could not see this thing's face, he was startled when a moment later he heard a gruff, no problem, and then, help? The human was helping scoop up wayward bits of printed tree pulp. Soon the large human, dressed in military fatigues that Alancor knew clothed those who brought death. Being friendly, he had been under the impression that all military tribes were gruff and unforgivable. Day one, and already he felt like he knew nothing once again about these strange, bipedal creatures. Then the creature overextended its jaw with a small pop right in front of Alancor's face. And just as suddenly, the soldier was yelling, snatching him by his upper limbs and crushing grip. Double frick. What had given him away? Wait, the dude I caught was an avian. I just thought he was a sociopath, which would have automatically failed him for any sort of job test here. I remember the screening for that crap. It was intense, Lieutenant Rod said as his arms waved about frantically, his eyes wide behind his thin glasses. That's usually what it means when someone doesn't yawn back. The whole little green men thing is new, plus, um, he looked human. Didn't he look human? The tall, bespeckled man paced back and forth uneasily at the very thought. End of story. Story number two. Vulcan, written by D. Raiden. The lift hummed softly as it rose towards the bridge of the ship, and there was little that I could do but wait. He really would think that an interstellar civilization a thousand years more advanced than us would have something more advanced than lifts. But as it turned out, no. The galaxy ran on a, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Which meant that while their tech was fancy, it was only a thousand years more advanced, barring FTL drives than ours. When our first FTL-capable ship had first contact a couple of the systems over from Sol. We didn't expect humanity to be anything special. We both were, and we weren't. The lift stopped, and I walked into the bridge, the space lighting up from the LED strips of my suit. There was one annoying thing about alien ships. They were pitch dark. As it turned out, that was something unique about humans. We had eyes. Apparently, that was rare. Very rare. Apparently, Earth was the only place where life evolved eyes. We couldn't believe it at first, because what the hell? It has evolved three times independently on Earth for crying out loud. But no, the bridge was filled with clicking and rasping sounds, and the captain turned to me before he approached. I did my best not to cringe as the lightly rat-like captain's lobster-like feelers brushed across my shoulder and the sides of my face as he clicked at me. 
my translator in my ear, translating for me. Welcome aboard, Specialist Jackson. I am Captain k k k k k k do, do you find your living space? I could see the color shifting across his short fur. There was something most species had. No eyes, no optical defenses. You could literally see at least hints of their feelings. Captain K was nervous. I did, thank you, Captain. I answered and smiled at him. Not that he could tell easily, as I reached up and touched his left feeder with the back of one hand. I am ready to get to work. Of course, your shift at the bridge sign station is about to start. Are you certain you're capable of working a double shift without rest? Yes, sir, I answered. It was only eight hours, after all. And other things humans had over most aliens. We were persistence hunters. We were built to follow antelope across the scorching savanna for three days straight. While omnivores or even predators weren't rare, aggressive species did have a better chance to get to the top of the food chain and civilization after all. We were the first ones with that specific hunting trick. Heading over to the science station, I touched the antenna of the giant bug sitting there and took her place so that she could get some rest. Reconfiguring the chair to something a bit closer to an ergonomic for humans, I sat down and slid a pair of glasses down before my eyes as I plugged into the console. While I could use their tactile and audio-based interface, even getting text-based interface was rather nice. So in short, humans could keep working a lot longer than most aliens, had a sense that they simply didn't, and on top of it all, we could read them easily enough to basically be empathic. We thought the galaxy would be full of amazing aliens, strange phenomenons, and alien technology. It turned out that we were completely right. Other than teleporters, we weren't that far from that old Star Trek series. But what we really, really didn't expect was for us to be the Vulcans of the universe. Science officer reporting in, Captain, I said as I logged onto the system. All senses read clear. We are safe for war. Captain K sat down in his chair, his feelers moving through the air, testing the currents. Acknowledged, science officer. Helm, engage. And so we were off to explore the universe and all its wonders. It was just too bad that nobody but humans could see it. End of story. Story number one. Purpose built. Written by LG Father Anthracite. Pets are a fairly common sociological phenomenon to the species of the galactic legal forum. For some, like the Baconar, aesthetics are key. They keep vividly colored bird type pets, which sing melodically. Some, like the Zichki, keep pets for practical purposes, feeding food waste biomatter to their hog like demoon. The backbonding myrrh keep a few spurling around simply to fill out pack numbers. But humans keep pets for a great many reasons. Aesthetics, companionship, anxiety relief. Studies show that humans recover from illness and injury faster when visited by a care animal. Human pets run the gamut from small fish to massive predators. Goldfish, gerbils, hedgehogs, rats, ferrets, cats, dogs, hamsters, lizards, snakes, way too many kinds of insects. Humans will keep nearly anything as a pet. Dogs, though. Dogs were feet unseen in the universe. Humans have been breeding dogs for longer than they've been able to keep records, and they bred them to do absolutely insane things. Huskies are bred to run dozens, even hundreds of miles, with little rest, in arctic conditions, while towing hundreds of kilograms behind them. Dushunt were bred to hunt badgers in their burrows. There were multiple breeds dedicated to hunting bears. Bears! When most GRQ members hear about bears for the first time, they assume it's some sort of joke, right up until they see the pictures. And humans, those lunatics, decided bears needed hunting. Pointy sticks and sharp rocks weren't getting the jump done alone, so humans took their hunting dogs. 
and specifically bred them to hunt bears. Some bears weigh in at over 400 kilograms. They hunted massive, clawed, flesh-eating monsters with pointy sticks and dogs that barely weighed a tenth of their prey's weight. Bulldogs, foxhounds, rat terriers, humans bred a dog to hunt everything. Rhodesian Ridgebacks were used to hunt lions. Lions! What kind of expletive deleted, murder-minded expletive deleted, takes on an apex predator, tames it, trains it, and then redesigns it to hunt other apex predators? And do you want to know what's worst? Humans love them. Humans bred apex predator hunting monsters, capable of taking on class 10 death world nightmares, and winning, and they keep them as pets. They live in the same houses, eat at the same place, and even sleep in the same bed. Two top-tier predators from wildly different evolutionary branches of death world teamed up and are practically symbiotic at this point. Not just pets, but family members. When a human dog dies, humans can spend days even months grieving. Dogs, for their part, have been known to find their humans, even if they are separated by hundreds of miles, or spend the rest of their lives waiting for their humans to return home, not knowing that the human has died. Once, pre-contact, there was a human monarch who bred dogs. She kept them for years, 